Um, so I guess we're going to talk about the hunt. Uh, so, you know, who within here has actually raised like venture money or any sort of angel investment? How much have you raised? Is there any convertible notes? Put a cap or no? All right, awesome. Yeah, so what, what I guess what we'll talk about today is, you know, uh, how to raise money. Uh, and, and there's many ways to raise money. Uh, you know, my, my preference in raising money is actually high net worth individuals and family offices over venture capital. Um, I'm not a believer in uh, giving up your company to people that think they're smarter than me. Um, so that's just my opinion. Uh, uh, it may not be everybody else's opinion. Uh, but, um, you know, just to give you a little background myself, so we've been very lucky. Uh, you know, we we have raised you know four million, and we'll be raising more uh, thus far. And you know, we've been able to retain majority control of our company. Um, and I can get into the specifics on how we've done that, so you all can learn how to keep control of your own company. Um, and then you know how we've gone about our fundraising efforts, and we where those experiences and the networks are for us to elevate and build those relationships. So my background is I grew up. Uh, in Brooklyn, uh, in Park Slope, uh, the Sunset Park area. Um, you know, I come from a political family, so you know, I had that baggage with me. Uh, and so we had a lot of um, you know, political network, but we didn't have a lot of access to capital network. Um, so literally at age 17, instead of going to NYU, I decided to go into the military. Um, and it was accepted into this program called the JAG Officer Program, where they basically accelerate you to become a military uh, lawyer uh, within six years, they pay for your law school and all that great stuff, and I get to jump out of planes, which is fun. Um, and so, you know, long story short, this general uh, took me under his wing and mentored me uh, to basically put me into what's called the ROTC program, uh, which basically pays for your schooling and all that great stuff. And that's where, it, you know, my whole passion of education and technology uh, started. Um, you know, through that process, I also was part of uh, Obama's transition team for international trade and economics. I was the youngest uh, top fundraiser uh, for the, you know, what's called the National Finance Committee. Um, and when they asked me to join the administration, I declined because I wanted to do something either in health or education, which are very two big passions of mine. Um, and so the idea of the current company, which I founded, called Veritas, came into my head based on the friction that I had coming out, you know, through the military. Um, you know, so, you know, in 2009, when I started to think about the idea, you know, I had no funding, I had nothing, I was on my couch, I had to learn how to code and put out the first product to the market. So I coded out the first iteration of the product, uh, and a year later we made about $200,000 in revenue. It was just me by myself, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't think that the, it was just an idea and a dream, basically. Um, and, you know, from there, I realized that you know, the product I had built was more of like a lifestyle business. I didn't want to be in a lifestyle business. If I wanted to do that, I'd open up a you know, store and sell some clothes or whatever it may be. Uh, I wanted to create something that can become a billion dollar company. Um, and so we started to you know, uh, you know, look around the market, scan the market, see what was in, unique in the market opportunity in the education space that we're in. And you know, lo and behold, we fell you know, onto it by accident. Um, and so once we fell onto it by accident, we knew that we had to hit certain metric points in order for us to raise capital. Um, whether it's traction, and traction can be, be defined off multiple things. It could be, you know, uh, how many people have validated your product and if people within the industry vertical are, you know, are vouching for your product. So that alone, you know, gives you a validation point. If you have three of those or two of those people, and, you know, in that regard, you're going to be able to raise some level of an angel. Uh, typically, the way it works is that you have an angel financing and then you have um, you know, uh, preferred equity round, then you have a mature round, and then you go into the C and D round. Um, but through that process, you know, I, I got I got in touch with some folks that mentored me on how to raise capital, and you know, I learned that if we can do notes, you know, my preference is un uh, convertible notes uncapped with a two-year maturity date, so that way you're not your back is not against the wall uh, the following year, uh, and having to raise money just because uh, you did a one-year maturity, and some investors. If you know, an investor calls your note, you have to you know, let every notify people that you've defaulted on your note. So it creates like nervousness to the, to the investors. And at that point, you potentially put your company in jeopardy. Um, so you know, we created these two note, uh, two year note extensions with a 20% discount uncapped. Um, and so that by doing that, what that did, it allowed us to maintain positioning and control of our company. 
um, without having to put our backs against the wall and really focus on building out the product, which is what we wanted to do. Um, and once we did that, uh, we started to see that the market traction was going and we then did another round. Uh, you know, we, we did this ongoing round where we brought on like family offices, uh, few we have about four venture capitalists and four family offices in our deal. Uh, some of them are like Comcast, Atlas, uh, then we have like the Blue Ridge, Foundi uh, Blue Ridge uh, founder, you know, uh, we have you know, some other folks, I'm happy to put you in touch with them. Um, and yeah, we, we raised money this time on a note with a cap, right? So we raised it on a cap so we can start gaining a sense of, of the pulse of where the potential valuation of the company may be. Um, and our, our cap note was pretty high. Uh, and then, you know, we started to continue to gain traction from that point. And we started to think through, you know, is now the time to raise capital, uh, you know, or not? And if we did raise capital now, you know, we essentially could probably get maybe like seven or eight million dollars more on top of the valuation that we had on that cap. Um, and we would give up maybe like 10% or 20% of the company for something we didn't feel was a good deal for us. Um, so what we decided to do was basically focus on taking the company, you know, revenue positive, or you know, getting gaining more validators. Um, and these validators, you know, could be individuals that signed like a hundred thousand dollar deal with you, you know, fifty thousand, sixty thousand. You know, Salesforce started with a ten thousand dollar deal, um, and you know, and, and they're like massive, right? So, uh, and so based on those, you know, positionings with the contracts. And based on these people who are industry experts and validators, we now are well positioned in the market to have a substantial valuation. At a, you know, whether we decide to raise five million or ten million or twenty million, whatever it is that we want to. Um, and you know, if you're ever in a position where you know you're right at the brink of potentially hitting cash flow positive, but your notes are like going to be you know maturing, you know, say like in four months, you should never feel pressured that you have to go raise capital. Uh, what you should do is, as long as you're delivering, you're, if they're good investors and good partners, they'll extend their notes and you should extend them two years out and negotiate with them. Sometime they'll be, you know, pain in the butts and, you know, try to push back, but, you know, you should really push as aggressive as possible. And another thing that you can do, and, you know, you let me know, you know uh, how much detail you want me to get into financing, but you can actually do, if there is an investor that's a pain in the butt, you can actually do a roll-up where you bring in, like, a high net worth individual buy out their notes on their uh, loan you know, percentage and have them give you another million dollar infusion or whatever the number is so you can do an extended um, you know, bridge which will allow you to maintain and continue to grow um, you know, to be you know, uh, at a higher valuation. Um, so you know, those are just some tactics that we've used. Um, but you know, where you meet these you know, venture capitalists or high net worth individuals are through things and how I met them was just through other uh, young entrepreneurs or organizations like I'm co-chair something called the Milky Young Leaders Council. Um, it was started by Mike Milky, who's a billionaire, um, and he brings together. It's like a mini, uh, what's called a mini, like young global leaders for the World Economic Forum. So another one where you can build relationships would be like the YGL, which is Young Global Leaders uh, World Economic Forum. Um, you know, there's things like DLD, which is a digital life design. Um, in my opinion, it's probably the premier global tech conference uh, because everybody before going into Davos, uh, which is the World Economic Forum, stops you know in Munich and then heads over to um, you know Davos. So you'll meet like Carlos Slim, or you'll meet people like Ricardo Salinas, or you know or people like um, you know Jeff Bezos. I mean, they're all there, uh, and it's an invite you know only type of setup. Uh, the other one, which is interesting, where you can build your network. Uh, at a very high level, it's called Teconomy. Uh, they're actually based in New York City. Uh, they actually have, I spoke at their last event, they have something going on right now in Detroit. Um, you know, some of the other places as well uh, are, um, I'm trying to think on top of my head, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, uh, what is it, uh, Sun Valley. Uh, the, Sun Valley is interesting, so they have one that's like pre, um, you know, startup, so basically entrepreneurs that are not like, Zuckerberg level, but you know, starting out. Um, so that's like started by Allen and Company. Uh, so they basically have a lot of good uh, network, and these are like networks at like the highest. You know, I'm talking about like the highest level. You know, where the founders of Google go. Uh, you know, so it's pretty unique access to 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 network. 
Uh, and that's how I built my access. I started, you know, I got mentored. I started going to these conferences. I became like co-chair of these young leaders or whatever it may be. And that led me to having credibility when I would go present in front of venture capitalists or family offices uh, to gain that. I never built out a business plan. I just think that's a waste of time. Uh, you know, I never, you know, projections, uh, you can project that you're going to be a hundred million dollar company. The reality is they're worthless uh, because, you know, things are going to change. You know, if you don't have multiple pivots along the way, then your company is not going to be successful. Um, so I'm a big believer in having like 20 slides that just tell your story, but a story that could be, you know, um, defensible. A story that could be, you know, told in a way that shows, you know, that you're thinking through the strategy in a way to take it to scale. And once the scale is what happens next. Um, and then it really comes down to the founder, you know, how animated, how it's, you know, how you know, lovable or you know, excited they get by you, by your energy, um, and whether you connect with them. Um, you know, and, and if you don't connect with them, that's not gonna happen. You, you also wanna make sure when you're working with investors that it's not just about that partner or that investor, you wanna meet like their whole entourage. Uh, because what happens is that venture capital partner, in the case of VC, if the VC partner leaves the firm and you have no access to the other partners, your access to that firm is very limited. Um, and so you always want to build access to all the partners and that allows you to even build a greater network uh, that they may have that that partner may not have. Um, you know, the other thing is that uh, if you're dealing with family offices, they tend to leave you alone uh, most of the time, which is great. Um, and that's awesome. And they tend to have a great network, um, but they're a little bit more cautious of opening up their network because of the names that they are and the families that they have around them. Um, you know, so when you deal with them, you approach them with like, uh, you know, uh, with what I call like, you know, a slower approach than you would with like a VC. Uh, but they'll, they'll be very, very, very helpful as well. Um, and so, you know, in, you know, as we continue to look at the landscape of, you know, investment within Latino or African American startups, um, there are, are funds that do focus specifically on that, right? So like Comcast Ventures, you know, they have a $20 million fund that focuses on on, uh, is it, on, on minority entrepreneurs. We, we happen to be, Tanya and I are actually two of their portfolios. Uh, I think there's only about like 20 or 30 Latinos that are venture back in the United States, which is a sad number. Uh, and that's pretty sad. Uh, there's more African Americans, which is great. So. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Why do you believe that is that so? Why is it there so many people? Yeah, so I think, you know, it's interesting. So I think it's a couple of factors. One is, you know, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, taking the military mindset that I learned in the Army and applying it to entrepreneurship has been very beneficial to me, right? Because, like, there's nothing that can stand in my way, you know, at all. Like, I don't care what wall we have to get through, we're going to get it done. And so, you know, Latinos by nature, at least you know, in our case, my mom would always say to me, I don't need the pobrecito. So you have that mindset that your mom is always feeling like bad for you in some capacity. So it creates like a limitation factor. The other thing is that our communities, the ones, the Latinos that have made it, the African Americans are better structured in this actually. But the Latino community is not, there's no, there's no network of access to capital, right? Because the older, like what I call them like the, the elders, they don't want to give back, they, they don't understand technology. Right, so you have like folks that have done very well in tech, uh, in media, entertainment, and Latino community that don't. But then you have people like in real estate, like Don Peebles from Florida, and all these other folks. They invest in tech. I mean, they, you know, they, they, they have no problem writing a check. But so, so that's the big issue uh, that occurs. And then also, it also has to do with your network, right? I mean, if you have no access, to, unless you go to Stanford, Harvard, Yale, uh, you know, and all these great top one tier schools. You have a limited network, so you have to, you're already three levels, four levels, you know, behind. You're trying to get, you know, catch up, and so that's why, like for me, like I could have gone to NYU, I chose not to. These networks that you know I just mentioned are at the highest levels, you know, and that's that's where you build the network at the highest level, so you have access to that level of capital, right? Because when you walk into the Milken Summit, you're gonna be you're gonna see the founder of Blackstone, the founder of BlackRock, the founder. Uh, you know, Starwood, the founder, you know, all, these are all founders, and as a founder, you should only be dealing, in my opinion, you should only be dealing at the founder level. Like, I don't want to meet with the vice president, that's not, and I let my, my chief operating officer meet with them. It's not an arrogant thing, it's just like, you have to position yourself as I'm the founder and the CEO, and that's where I'm dealing at. Um, you want to, you should, I mean, the way I position is like, you should be meeting only with like, 
you know, uh, the top tier. And if you're dealing in government, you're gonna be only with like the governor and the president, right? So, um, you know, that's, that's the mindset to have uh, when you're, you know, doing this in, in the entrepreneurship world. And, and it works well if you can do it, you know, you know effectively. So, uh, I forgot what I was saying. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, so basically, um, you know, so you have Comcast Ventures, you have something called, uh, there's an investor, uh, well, you have a New York City Partnership Fund. It's run by a lady named Catherine Wilde. Um, and, you know, they invest mainly in health and bioscience. Um, you, you have another, uh, you know, uh, fund, um, what's his name? Um, you know, the Johnson Family started BT. So they have a family office. They're based in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of, there, there are some funds out there that focus on Latino, you know, uh, African American minority, you know, in, investment. Women, there's, for women, there's called Golden Seeds. Golden Seeds actually received $50 million from the state of New York to invest in female entrepreneurship. There's also Joanne Wilson um, as a female, who she's a big investor uh, in, in female startups. Um, and so, you know, there is access, if, if you want money, you're going to be able to find money, you just have to have the right connection point to money. The, the other thing is that, you know, if there are entrepreneurs that have been successful in raising capital and they introduce you to that capital, then you're more like, you, you have a higher ability to potentially close that deal because that investor will trust that entrepreneur's judgment, right? So if, instead of you doing a cold call, if you're introduced, you know, by someone that either sold the company or has raised money and they're doing well, then you know, you're going to be in a better position. Um, and then the other thing is like New York Technica, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. Um, you know, it's not just attending it, but it's showcasing your product in it, right? I mean, you want to be showcasing it there. And you know, Andrew Raji, he, he runs it. I'm happy to put you all in touch with him. I'm sure he'll love all your emails. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's what you know, uh, is, is needed in order to be able to you know, raise the funds that you all are looking for. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Errol King. Uh, I'm, I run a gaming and education company. Uh, Nana asked me a question earlier about what is my main challenge right now. I think my challenge right now is that we, uh, we have a decent uh, uh, revenue stream right now. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence about uh, whether to take investment or to just grow organically, and I understand those are just two different paths. One is a little bit slower, uh, longer. One is, uh, you know, shorter and faster. And we've been uh, having some really great discussions with investors. Um, you know, if if somebody has you know decent cash flow and are, and are growing at a, at a moderate rate, uh, you know, what is your suggestion? Yeah, so I'm a big proponent in not getting diluted. <laughs> Uh, unless it's for like super scale growth and with the right partner. Uh, so you know, the question that I would ask myself if I were you is, you know, what's my runway, uh, you know, burn rate, uh, you know, what's my revenue coming in, and what's the trajectory that it gives me, and then calculate that versus, you know, my defensibilities if I have a patent pending or whatever defensibilities you may have, and then make a decision on whether it makes sense to potentially you know, raise capital today at a lesser valuation or tomorrow. Because investors at the end of the day are gonna say, if this is an investment, you know, that's ten thousand dollars below, you know, um, you know, cash flow break even versus a hundred and fifty thirty, you're gonna get a higher valuation, right? At the end, in an ideal world. Sometimes revenue doesn't even matter to them. What matters I mean, it could be like, you know, all the other uh, traction, right? So it's really, you know, taking into account your industry vertical and you know, my buddy is actually in gaming education. So, so I know it somewhat, uh, you know, and then really understanding where do you want to take this business. If you want to be at $100 million, is it necessary to be, you know, raise the capital right now, or can you wait six months, and then what are the potential, you know, uh, impact from a negative component that you, you may, it, my, my gut is if you're already raising, if you're already making revenue and you can hold out for six months, I would start raising you know, money in about 90 days instead of raising money. Today, it takes you away from your business. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and if you're the founder and the main business rainmaker, and you're away from your business, then you can't focus on taking it to revenue and scale. Absolutely. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so I think Xavier Stewart, I'm the CEO of Driven Labs. We're an auto tech uh, software company. Um, so you mentioned some of the metrics that VCs are looking for. Um, one of 
one of them's traction? Can you talk about some of the others? Sure, yeah. So I, I think that uh, you know, metrics are determined based on your business, right? I mean, for us, our metric is not how many users we have. It's how many, how much revenue or how many contracts and what the lifetime value of the contracts may be, as well as what's the calculated uh, acquisition cost for that customer and the conversion rate on that customer increasing. So, you know, whereas like if you're in a social media app, you know, they're going to wonder about unique hits and all this other, you know, users and all this other great stuff. So it just really depends on your industry vertical. Um, and that's how you determine that, right? Like you're in what industry are you in? Uh, so is it more of like an enterprise sale product? Yeah, so they're going to focus on, you know, what is the calculation to acquire customer acquisition? You know, what, what is the conversion of that contract? You know, how long, how big can that contract get? And how many years can that contract be extended to? And then what's your, you know, defensibility on your product? Um, you know, what's your advantage and your value proposition? And, you know, if you're in an enterprise, if you're selling B2C, then they're going to wonder about your marketing. If you're selling B2B, then you can reduce your marketing costs, but then you're going to need salespeople. And if you can create a sales force structure that, you know, maybe you and someone else, then you can, you know, execute and implement it fairly well. So, quick question, my name is Ben. I run a company called Beyondster. We're centered, I guess, in the uh, education and technology. So, one of the questions that I had was, most recently, we broke the relationship with an I guess, but great person. He wanted to bring some hedge funds and VCs to the table, which we weren't sure if we were ready for that. But like what's your, I guess, thought process behind that? Because right now we're out of beta, getting ready to launch here very soon. We just didn't know which one to go with that. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think it really comes down to you, right? I mean, if you're, if you feel in your gut that you're ready. Uh, to take on capital and that fiduciary responsibility and make it into, uh, you know, what they, in their mind would be like a, a, a real company, um, then that's what you should do. Uh, if you don't need their capital today or if you're, you're not sure or you've just never been in that scenario, then it's just more of a sense of getting comfortable with them. And what I would do is I would bet all of them. I, I would want to get in touch with uh, founders that they've invested at that have had negative outcomes. I would want to get in touch with founders that they've invested at that have had positive outcomes. So I want to know the good, the bad, and the ugly um, about these folks, right? And, and so that's how you really can tell about an individual. Because at some point, when you get married these, with these people, there's going to be friction. I mean, I mean, it's it's impossible to be in business and not have friction, you know, of some capacity. Um, and so your interests may be misaligned with their interests, and so your heads are going to bump, right? So that, that brings me back to something that's very important. Like, you know, you know, as you do your deal structure with your early angels, I would highly recommend that you, you basically create a voting right agreement with all of them. So you control their voting rights at all points. Even if you're diluted ownership wise to like, you know, 27%, you still control 53% of the voting rights. And then when you do your board structure, uh, you know, you, you basically give yourself two board seats so now you have two votes, and then you bring on board, board member, and you have five board members, you control the company. Another way to do it is that you basically uh, make yourself the controlling um, you know, factor in the administrative uh, plan, which is the issuance of stock of everything. And so now you have all three factors covered, uh, and, and you basically can never be tossed out, uh, unless, you know, unless you do something like a felony or something. But yeah, you know, that's not going to happen. At least. Yeah, I guess two full questions. And so based on that, like how early would you say it's okay to take on a VC or somebody with again, just that type of company that invests specifically, let's say in tech, but you know, right now we don't have tons of users and those kind of things. So with them being able to get more equity up front, I guess you kind of uh, pointed out some of the things we can do, but like where would you kind of say, okay, you know what, take on VC or just kind of stay with me right now? How early is I mean, it depends who the VC is. Like, we took on Atlas Ventures from Boston really early. Uh, but they're known to be, like, you know, super early investors, right? So it just depends on the DNA of the venture firm. Um, what I would do is I would split, I would do an angel and a VC. I would never have just one investor because, uh, you know, you want to have at least two. Uh, you, know, you don't want to have 100, but you want to have two, right? I mean, or, or multiple investors. Um, 
So you know, I, we brought him on before we you know we just had like the concept idea, uh, and you know we brought him on at you know for like a quarter million dollars or something, um, and you know and then you know we're able to take it from there and continue to scale it. But again, it really depends on where you're at with your evolution and where you feel comfortable with them. But I would diligence them. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. You can actually pitch during just the concept there. You can pitch with the napkin, man. <laughs> you know, what you're selling is yourself, right? I mean, an entrepreneur is a salesman or a saleswoman, you know, and and you're always selling. I mean, you're, you're going to sell, you know, to you know to, to the investor. You're going to sell to your customers. You're going to sell to your colleagues. Why they should come on board and be part of your team. So you're always selling. So. You know, as long as you have thought out, you know, a product of some sort, uh, and you can speak to how it can be executed in your mind, and people get excited about it, then yeah, you know, they would come in. Good question: uh, When you met with any of these investors, institutional or uh, private, was there was there ever a question that you were asked that was uh, unique or that you were caught off guard? You were prepared for? I mean, investors ask all funny questions, man. You know, they, they ask, you know, why are you wearing sneakers? I mean, I never went in a, in a suit or a tie or even a button-down jacket to see these guys. I mean, I, this is, you know, this is how I went. Um, yeah, they, they, they ask, like, all crazy things. I mean, I got asked once what kind of dog, what kind of animals I like. Who's I mean, trying to, you know, measure my algorithm if I fit into their algorithm. Um, you know, so, so, you know, you get really stupid questions, and sometimes they'll piss you off. But you know you can't let, you can't show that, right? I mean, because if you show someone that you're angry or they've gotten under your skin, you become the weaker person, right? So you always want to be like very calm, cool, collective, and have a straight face with these guys, because then they can't read you, and if they can't read you, they get excited by you. It's kind of odd, but it's interesting, right? Uh, and and if you can handle the pressures of what they're going to, because they're going to put you through a mental, you know, that what they'll do is you'll meet with one you know, one partner, the partner will say, I'm bringing in my analyst, analyst will diligence you. You know, they'll probably try to find out where you were born, you know, all that crap. Uh, and then you'll come in for a partner meeting. So there in the partner meeting, usually there's like four, you know, how big the fun is. Maybe I've been in a partner meeting where there was like 20 partners, all right? And so, you know, they, they're there to like, you know, just slam you, like, you know. And if the partner, this is how you know if your, your investor is a good guy. If your VC guy is basically softballing you questions, then he's a good guy. If he's like there trying to drill you and stab you, then he's not the right guy. And, and, and you can read that. You can read that body language when you're in that room. I mean, it's all about how well you can read that and, and connect with that energy. I'm very big on like the energetic connection with like the people you do business with. Yeah. Um, how often do you report back to them? And what is that? Yeah, we've turned down a lot of money, <laughs> uh, but you, you turn money down not because you know. I turn it down because they're not the right strategic alignment fit, or I don't feel connected to those people. Uh, you know, or I, you know, it's just like it's my gut, right? I want their money. Um, but you know, I re we do, you know, so we do a couple of reporting mechanisms. So uh, we have a monthly statement P and L that goes out to our board members. Um, only investors above a certain threshold will have our P and L. Uh, you don't want to get into a situation where. If you had ten investors that gave you hundred thousand dollars and one invest two investors gave you five hundred and then one wants a million, you can't give possibly give all of them the same uh, you know ear time. It, it just doesn't make sense. So you should focus, you should draw a sand line, and your sand line should be if I raised you know whatever uh, three million dollars, I'm only gonna focus on giving PLs you know to uh, to the you know five hundred thousand and above. Because otherwise you're gonna become an investor relation person and your gonna job is gonna be hundred percent on that. And, and, and you can't do that. So, um, you know, what we do is we send monthly P and L, monthly statements, once a month with an overview update of our traction. So, you know, like whether it's product operations, um, marketing, sales, design, our numbers, our revenue, uh, and then we have a monthly uh, advisory call, uh, which they're invited to. They don't show up. That's not our problem. You know, we're doing our job. Um, and so that usually takes 30 minutes. So that's. Yeah, it's pretty much the interaction that we have with them on a monthly basis. The, the bigger ones, uh, I'll tend to focus on a little more. You know, like yeah, you know, spend more time with them and try to, you know, keep them engaged. Um, but you know, the other ones, you know, you just keep them up. They're they're just happy to be in the deal. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, it's 
to them, they think they're lucky to be involved, right? So that's the way you should position it, those guys. Any other questions? Uh, for someone that's just starting out trying to connect uh, a business with an investor, like, what do you think is a good starting point for return of, of that investment? Um, I mean, I know the markets can vary, but uh, like, like, let's say like 15% or 20%, like, what would a typical high net worth, worth person be looking for? As return, and how, how quickly should you try to target a deal? So your question is like, what should be the equity stake a high net worth individual should take in your business when you raise capital? Right, or, or, the, or say no equity, but what, so how, what percentage of a return should you try to target to keep that net high net worth person interested in the deal? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you take it from that approach, you're never gonna raise money, right? right? I and mean, that's just the reality, because you know, you, you, if you, your job should be to get them excited about you and your product. It shouldn't be to get them excited and you positioning that this is my return, right? For that, they can move their money in Goldman and Tanya's friends can manage it, right? So, you know, that's that's the way to position it. Uh, and, you know, for again, I go back to, uh, you know, the, for the early investors, you know, just do it on a convertible debt. A lot of them will say, oh, we don't want to do convertible debt. I mean, it's a risk, right? Because if they pull out of your company, I mean, you want to have DNO insurance to protect you against bankruptcy, right? That's an important thing. Um, and then if you want to have it layered based on the amount of money that you've raised. Uh, but, you know, but basically, yeah, that's the route to go. Uh, from uh, And if they choose to want equity, you know, tell them to give you a, a, you know, a million dollars, you know, $500,000 at like, you know, and, and you value the company at like two and a half, three and a half posts, right? So they have like 10% or something. Um, and that positions you well as you go to the next level so that you can only go up. If you oh, if you do ever do a down round where you do like 40 million and you come down, that impacts you and all your investors. So you never want to overvalue, but you just want to value just right. VCs look down on you going into them with three or four convertible agreements on the books already? Yeah, I mean, if they did that, they would have never invested it. I mean, it, it, what makes you think that? I mean, I just, I just I've heard from them. Uh, I mean, that's that's not accurate. I mean, that hasn't been the case with us. Uh, I mean, that's never been an issue with with us at, when we raise money. Um, yeah, but they'll want to make sure that the notes are up to date and everything is aligned and all that stuff, uh, and you're not in default. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty much it. As long as you keep that line structure, your cap tables up to date. Um, I'm assuming you have a law firm. Um, yeah, so they should have all that in place. So you, you should always be ready. You know. Uh, your cap table and, and all those documents. Yeah. So I'm Nena Cornwell, we've never met before. <laughs> but I'm the founder and CEO of Student Dream, and we train underserved college students on how to launch earth shattering startups. And so as they're preparing to go into these meetings, what would you say is the best way to prepare? Because I think you've thrown out a lot of vocabulary that's been new to me. Um, so aside from kind of just knowing the basic documentation, et cetera, what would you say are some ways to prepare for these types of meetings with investors? I mean, it's it just really being yourself. I mean, if you try to be anyone else, you know, you're going to fail. Uh, I mean, I, I just went as myself. You know, I was very excited about my product, about my vision, and about what we've developed and the impact that we create. You know, showing that passion and that desire that it's not about the money, it's about the outcome where you want to grow this and making sure that your thought process is calculated to be able to explain from you know where you think it can go to where you see it going and how you can get there that's that's what they want to know they want to know that your brain thinking pattern uh, is you know uh, evolving in that way they know that you don't have all the answers today uh, but they know that you're able to articulate it in a way that allows you to grow that in a, in a positive direction any other questions I'll take this one and then we can stop. Thank you. My name is Joseph. When you did, when you pitched your concept, right, that's what it sounds like when you went uh, to your investors and you pitched the concept and they bought not only into the concept that you was Did you present a, a projection of, you know, uh, what the business could do potentially or was that even part of the equation of discussion? Yeah, when we did our first, uh, you know, two hundred something k, you know, we didn't have any projections. So it was just me with my, uh, with myself, <laughs> uh, and they gave us money and said, you know, all right, now go build a team and 
and bring a team together and you know, come back and see us in six months and we'll see if you've grown and if you've done well and we'll give you more money. Um, so it, it depends on the investor. Uh, it depends on the circumstance. Uh, we've been, we were fortunate at that point when we were there at that level uh, that we didn't need it then. Uh, but if you do need to come up with projections, just make sure there's something that are somewhat, you know, you can talk through them. Uh, and they're not, you know, going to be a billion dollar company in three years. I mean, it's an ideal world, but, you know, you want to be realistic as well. Sure. Can I just ask a follow-up question? So, uh, setting aside the projections, what do you in terms of a market analysis and really identifying your subset of that market, was that part of the discussion? Yeah, I mean, I, I need my market uh, in and out. I mean, I, I can, we're in the education industry. I mean, I, I can go toe to toe with any chancellor on, on education. Um, so, you know, yeah, you have to know your market. I mean, uh, at least, you know, for our industry, you do, right? Because there's a lot of policy implications. There's a lot of issues that could be around that. And if you don't know what you're talking about, you're going to look like an amateur, and you're going to say, "I'm not. This is too high risk. I'm not going to come in." You know. Um, but it, it depends. It varies on the uh, industry. Thank you. Anything else? All right, we're done. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right, bye.